conversation. So with that, um, you know, I mentioned a lot of words around, uh, you know, racial and ethnicity, uh, inclusive pedagogy. I wanted to give you both the opportunity to start explaining, you know, what the research that you do and your interests are, and perhaps, Anthony, you could tell us more about what the power storytelling is specifically through these lenses uh, is in particular interest to you what your research is about. Sure, yeah. Um, as you mentioned, I, well, to give a little bit of context, uh, my undergrad was in sociology uh, with a minor in American ethnic studies where I was attentive to issues of race, but often from a purely political standpoint of sort of like human to human interactions. And uh, later on when I went uh, to work at Colorado State University um, in student affairs. Um, I also picked up my master's in ethnic studies along the way. And what really expanded my thinking around uh, race was actually conversations with students in uh, STEM when I would just chat with them, you know, in the cultural center and they would tell me about uh, whatever they were learning about, uh, whether it had to do with like environmental racism or quorum sensing. And I think those sorts of conversations pushed me in the direction of the environmental humanities mm -hmm. and really uh, kind of pushed me to expand my research scope from sort of human to human interactions to thinking about ourselves as organisms within these larger environmental milieus or contexts. And so over time, um, working with various professors in English as well as uh, in anthropology, sort of became interested in thinking about um, the politics of energy and how it's portrayed in works of science fiction, as well as um, one of the faculty members that I work with is very interested in sort of our molecular entanglements with the environment, um, whether that's, you know, thinking of the outdoors or more maybe mundane settings like nail salons, um, households, where we get sort of regular mm -hmm. exposure to toxins and things like that, and sort of doing literary analysis in a way that um, kind of, I think of it through the metaphor of when you sort of refocus your camera from where the background is blurred to sort of bring it back in onto the same plane mm -hmm. as the maybe actors that you're looking at. And so um, over time learning, kind of stealing um, badly from the sciences, being able to do, I think more interesting kinds of analysis by paying really close attention to place and not just maybe the story as we're usually trained to do. I see. I wanted to ask you to, I think you alluded to it, but I didn't want it to sort of get missed in the in the weeds. You mentioned environmental humanities. Could you sure. explain more uh, for all of us, you know, what does it mean and, and what, what does it mean in the context of the self, of the human and how it positions uh, himself, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis with the environment or as part of it? Hmm. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, I think for me, I didn't turn to the environmental humanities until my master's. Um, but I think what I've found really attractive about it, um, in addition to sort of considering the human's place within the environment, I do think that the dominant strain, sort of how it's popularly conceived within English and the humanities at large, is that it can at times be a very white discipline, but where I've found the most um, inspiring lenses or frameworks for thinking about my work has been in, um, for instance, folks doing Native American and Indigenous studies, um, or comparative frameworks who are looking at, uh, let's say, literary or uh, movie depictions of environmental issues but through sort of knowledge frameworks that pull from indigenous traditions, or um, maybe uh, I think of them as very broadly like ecological epistemologies that mm -hmm. sort of move away from this Cartesian sense of there are human actors who are sort of like going about the world as a stage to we all act or and interact within very specific environments um, that sort of shape us uh, uh, just as much as we shape our environments. Mm. Um, That's fantastic. I, I think I really want to dig deeper there later, but maybe perhaps after we make some linkages uh, with Shanna's work. <laughs> so, I mean, Shanna has been working uh, as a physics uh, pedagogy expert for a very long time, and particularly in inclusivity, right? I don't want to paraphrase anything about your expertise, but, you know, why? I think the big question is, 
why does pedagogy need to be termed as inclusive? Shouldn't that be implicit already? Right. Okay, that's a great question. Thanks. Um, well, it's a and it's a really good question because it's it's actually one I'm almost never asked. Right. Like that's what I do. I do inclusive STEM teaching workshops, and I teach a lot of STEM faculty how to be more inclusive in STEM teaching. And a lot of them like, yeah, no, I want to be more inclusive. But um, this idea of like why and isn't it already implicitly inclusive? I think a lot of it a lot of folks might not realize, and this is what my center and folks at my center are realizing more and more, is like it's implicitly not at all inclusive because it was designed by and for predominantly Christian, white, able-bodied, heterosexual men, right? Like that's how teaching was designed and that's what institutions were designed for. And I didn't realize it, and it's good to recognize like my own positionality as a white woman and both my parents were higher education professors and when people ask me what I wanted to do when I grew up, when I was a kid, I was like, get my PhD in something. Like I didn't, like it was just, you know, I was sort of like born in academia and really like swam in it and not just academia, STEM academia. And so I think that uh, that that's a huge bias. Like that's a huge bias I'm bringing into it and really blocking me from so much of what Anthony, what you were talking about and what this whole class is about of this whole, this, um, idea of like STEM is not at all the ultimate way of doing things and the un objective unbiased way of doing things. And so um, a lot of faculty that I work with, you know, also need to like go through that realization of like the way that I, that they were taught is not the way that they need to teach. And um, there's actually, it's very problematic the way that they were taught. And so we, it's not implicitly inclusive at all yet because of who it was designed by. And so we're trying to make it more inclusive, but I think that it's a, it's a long journey and a lot of people think, oh, I'm doing X, Y, and Z. I don't know if you all have, do any of your classes have like active learning where you're like talking to each other? Does that happen? Some? No. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> are, you, are you all first years? You first years? Okay. Um, but yeah, well, you'll see. I mean, some, some classes are starting to have like this talk to your neighbor, right? Like they ask you a question and then you talk to your neighbor. Um, and so some faculty are like, oh, I'm being inclusive. I'm having them talk to each other. But there's still so much to the textbook and the way that the science is done and the way that what's well, chosen to talk, to be taught that is really not inclusive. And so thinking about that constant journey. Can I answer your question? Absolutely. I think I actually want to get educated and maybe we could make a little bit of a sort of engaged practice. I wanted to see whether we can all guess and how many different ways can we be non-inclusive in the classroom, mm -hmm. both as teachers or as uh, students, participants? Mm -hmm. um, I actually don't know. I'm really, it's an honest question. Does anybody, can, can we all kind of all participate in naming them and maybe Shana can tell us what we're missing? <laughs> yeah. So ways in which current classrooms are less inclusive or not. No, how, how can one be non-inclusive as a teacher, as a student? How right? can one be non-inclusive? Yeah. Okay, as a teacher and a student, yeah. It, you know, maybe the first thing that comes to mind is able-bodied logics, for example, cognitive differences in learning, right? I teach in one style mm -hmm. that happens to be really adapted for some people, but not for others. Mm -hmm. They lag behind, the GPA is lower, and I assume they're just not as smart, right? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Okay, any other guesses? Um, like books and literature they use, a lot of it, like in English classes in high school, was like white old men. Mm -hmm. And there's other writers that are just as good. What's your name? Oh, Ananya. Ananya. Okay, thanks, Ananya. Okay, so like the white old men, right? I haven't had this experience here. Oh, I'm MJ, but like some schools that I talked to when I was applying, students would say like, oh, like there are kids who spread false information because they're graded on curve, and so like the pre-med students would try to tell everybody else like. The wrong stuff about like the biology class so that the curve would benefit them more oh, yeah. so like setting up classes to be curved and foster that competition and i mean that might get a little bit of what you're talking about Anthony, in a way like that it's not just actors but it's the environment in which people are yeah. acting yeah. and so if the stem environment is one that's fostering competition then people might be tempted to do that rather than collaboration mm -hmm. um like Maybe like assuming background knowledge that comes from like a specific culture. Like I remember in my Spanish class, we had to do like an oral about like going to the airport and going on a plane. And there were a few kids in the class that like had never been to the airport. So like, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I know. I know some instructors that now don't 
make any cultural references at all, which is also that just because they're like, well, just the things that I'm consuming might not be the things that other folks are consuming, but yeah, um, those sorts of assumptions. And I think I make those all, I, like, I think a lot of it is you're, you're not aware when you're making those or I'm not aware. Any other examples? Yeah. Also like access to resources. Like if you tell your students to use a certain textbook, but someone can't like afford it or get access to it. Yeah, even technologies, right? I think I've contended with the fact I teach a lot of programming and modeling courses, and I contend with the fact that there's varying sort of computer capabilities that students bring. I don't know what to do about it. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I think that's very, and a lot of it is like making space to like at least learn about that and, right, because mm -hmm. there's so many assumptions implicit to anything, even, even like me saying like, raise your hand if you want to share and not knowing yet if everyone is able to raise their hand or like, you know, so like saying express with your voice if you want to share and we have um, like phone response tools and certainly are always like, you know, saying if, if you're not able to use a phone, like can you, a different device is fine, but I had a student come up to me and say like, because of motor abilities, they were having challenges like using their phone and clicking in and so, I mean, but every, the fact that the student has to come in and tell me that is like one more Right, burden on the student in order to tell me that. And so recognizing even when I'm trying to be inclusive by having more engagement and active learning and hearing their voice, it can also lead to exclusion and mm -hmm. making space yeah. for that. Great. Well, I appreciate all these examples. I learned a few things for sure. I wanted to sort of concentrate all of the attention for today uh, on, on language and the use of language and how it mediates uh, the information that we relay, whether we think that we're telling something that is objective technical uh, facts, like I'm teaching electromagnetism, mm -hmm. or they'll be telling, you know, a story about, you know, some sort of metaphor or something to explain uh, whatever we're trying to, you know, uh, relay in, in our, or convey in our message. And I think we jump very often into this. Uh, I'm just sort of borrowing from you, Anthony. We sort of constantly want to. Uh, somewhat obsessed about calling something fiction and nonfiction and trying to really make that distinction. And I think maybe part of this seminar series is to think about, well, where does, where, where does nonfiction start? Where does myth start? Uh, where does it end? And does it even matter so long as we are being able to convey um, any truth about ourselves or the environment that we find uh, or deem important? You know, and, and so this is a little bit uh, of a segue to ask you uh, any commentary that you have on the power of storytelling, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, and how that can sort of shape people's perceptions. So maybe perhaps you can offer some examples on, uh, you know, uh, indigenous storytelling, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think for me, one of the most helpful reframings has been around um, sort of the storytelling genres that we use to frame these larger problems that we're facing as um, a society or humanity as a whole. Um, and so thinking about how oftentimes when we talk about, say, climate change or um, species extinction, we often do it through uh, genres of like tragedy and elegy. And this is coming from uh, Ursula Heise, who's in English as well as IOES. And um, how, you know, at this point, the science is kind of all there. Uh, we know that climate change is a thing, but sort of thinking about the different frameworks that we use and what sorts of possibilities they might open up uh, for our thinking or shut down. And so studies showing that sometimes uh, you know, the kind of science communication that we think of as good and effective, just giving the facts, mm. can also be incredibly depressing. And so what does it mean to think about uh, maybe other genres or frameworks? And so um, one place that I've um, drawn a lot of hope has been from, uh, for instance, um, in a lot of uh, Indigenous studies, people uh, talking about, you know, uh, for instance, I think it's Nick Estes, who I believe is Padawad. Uh, I, I'm not sure what tribe he belongs to, but he talks about, you know, for our people and for our ancestors, like the apocalypse already happened mm -hmm. uh, with uh, colonial contact. And yet we've found ways to survive and repair our relationships mm -hmm. and maintain our relationships 
to the earth, mm -hmm. um, or uh, folks like Dean Sarnilio, um, who works with Native Hawaiian studies, who talks about, you know, in indigenous Hawaiian ways of thinking about our relationship to the earth, um, it's like a mother, and you don't leave your mother when she's sick. And so like, what kinds of different commitments or futures are we forced to envision? If we think of earth as someone that we have a relationship with rather than, you know, someplace, you know, we'll just blast off to Mars and find a way to terraform it. And so mm -hmm. like, where do we direct our mental energies or imaginations and how that can really affect um, the direction that we kind of do our research or think yeah. about? Absolutely. I think this this links quite well to uh, the point that was made earlier about storytelling and the underlying narratives, right? And I think one that is really common, at least in STEM, I, I want to ask you, is this, and I'm sure you would agree, uh, but you can prove me otherwise, this, the, the narratives and the logics of, uh, that I would call extractionist, right? Our relationship to the environment, our relationship to um, even engineering or production of technology is almost always extractionist, right? Mm -hmm. We're trying to allocate resources, maybe and increase the efficiency of that allocation. Right? And I think that is, I feel, a way of storytelling that we implicitly adopt as part of how we study, um, particularly STEM processes. And I think it's largely driven by you know, also economic and political systems, mm -hmm. right? But, um, I wanted to ask you about that in, in the sense of also inclusivity, right? Can we be inclusive of our own safety and each other by considering our relationship to our environment in a different way that is an extractionist? It's a good question. <laughs> um, and it's, right, and I'm just gonna repeat it to make sure that I've got it and as I think about it. Um, so, right, can we be inclusive in STEM by being less, extractionist of our environment and thinking about things as extracting from our environment that's what you're saying and thinking about that in our own teaching as mm -hmm. well and getting that across um yeah that's and yeah so I want to think about that but what it makes me think of and I don't know if it's directly answering your question but that's what every good panelist does right if they don't know the answer they like talk about something they do know but you should let me know if it's not um is a there's a book called Braiding, Braiding Sweetgrass. I don't know if anyone's read it, but it's by Robin Wall Kimmerer, who's um, an indigenous biologist and a poet. And she talks a lot about um, how when she went to college to learn biology, she was talking to like her, her counselor, her first counselor and the counselor's like, oh, why do you wanna learn about biology? And she's like, you know, a freshman and a college and um, had grown up um, not, not, familiar with academia and environments. And so she was like, I wanna understand why the these two types of plants that are growing and I'm not a biologist at all, so I don't remember what they were, but she's like, one is maybe purple and one is yellow. And I just wanna understand like why they look so beautiful together on the mountain when they're growing at the same time. And the counselor was like, that is not biology, right? Like that's not, you're in the wrong department. Like you wanna go into art. Um, and what she later learned because she stuck with biology and learned is, the you know the evolutionary forces that led to those plants growing together at the same time and led to those colors and being complementary and how they were connected with their environment and probably with the pollinators and a bunch of other biology stuff I didn't fully understand but like you know she was asking a question that was connected to science but not connected to science the way that we mm -hmm. see it now and not in an extractionary way at all but in a way of just understanding how is science connected to what we perceive and what animals perceive and so in a totally different way rather than like what how can I get as many logs as possible out of that forest or however people might have thought about it I don't know if this is answering your question yeah, but, surely, I mean um, yeah that's okay. it's an <laughs> really open-ended question <laughs> okay know. right but, what, um, what makes yeah. me think is the difficulty of linking that you know I'm also thinking as a the university as a to call it the you know the academic industrial complex that the implicitly what we generate, and particularly here in South Campus, we generate uh, marketable products, people that can enter the workforce. And I'm, I'm wondering, I'm contending with the fact that, yes, what if we taught this way, but then these, these students that would become part of the workforce are still working in a system that is very much extractionist, right? And so um, 
Well, here's a question, maybe for you or maybe for other people. It's like, what's the point of education? What's the purpose? And maybe this is what you're getting at, right? And like right now, the purpose of use of STEM and NSF funds us in STEM is to prepare future STEM workforce, right? Like that's that's when what you get grants for. And then it's mm -hmm. like, and maybe this is what you're getting at, but I yeah. don't know. Um, I, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I just, I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm coming into a corner. I don't know what to do about that. It's a reality, right? Of the system that we are, we, our ta we task to create, again, marketable products. Yeah. Workforce development to enter the American workforce, American ingenuity, competitiveness, you call it. You know? Right. Um, and I mean, I, I mean, I, I think it does need to shift. And I'm really going to welcome ideas from you all as the folks being educated. And uh, one of the things I do is I co-teach in a cluster course. Is anybody taking the cluster? Okay, cool. I'm co-teaching the food cluster. Are any of you in the food cluster? Oh, oh. <laughs> okay, great. You always seem to like sneaking in late. Um, so then, um, and so then maybe you can speak to this too, but like what I love about the cluster course, especially the one that my current instructor is teaching, you'll see how different what I'm going to teach, but she's teaching activism in the course, right? So I'm going to be teaching science and the science of sustainability and that approach. And she's, but our project, like our final project is students writing a letter to someone, somehow, you know, taking part in some form of activism around food and sustainability. And so they're integrating the science that they're teaching with how to make change. And so instead of like creating future people that are going to be part of this extractive STEM workforce, we're trying to like, you know, educate folks and how can you shift things that are problematic in existing, the existing society and think about solutions and use what you're learning to think about those solutions, which again, Sergio, I don't know if that's what you're getting at or if it's. Um, Absolutely. Okay. So I yes. want to do more of that, but like, this is the one special class I get to do that. In other classes, I just got to teach physics, you know, like cover Newton's laws. Um, <laughs> But I can talk a little bit about what I do there too, if that's helpful. Or like Actually, that. I mean, that's a good segue for a question that I wanted to ask both of you. Um, this is something that I, I've been wanting to touch for a long time, right? And, and like to talk about the legitimacy of, to continue on storytelling, fiction versus nonfiction, the legitimacy of what you teach when you teach, you know, uh, thermodynamics or Newton's laws, right? And the legitimacy of, uh, storytelling through nonfiction, or for example, to pick the example you just mentioned, you know, the idea that, for example, certain under certain indigenous frameworks, or you know, the apocalypse has already happened. And, you know, I think many of us are trained to hear these two things and and you know potentially be tolerant to both ideas, but create a hierarchy of legit legitimacy where Newton's uh, principles have you know, a physical observable that we like to deem knowledge because we can prove it through the scientific knowledge. And even at best, when I agree with this sort of idea, you know, this sort of, I would call a mystical idea, right? That, well, maybe this has happened and it's a way to understand the world. I would categorize it not really as uh, something that can produce, um, so to speak, make sense in a legit, as legitimate of a way as, as for example, gravity might, might make, right? Mm -hmm. And this is where I want to sort of ask you both for your take on um, how you think this shapes uh, our society. And particularly, instead of talking so much about broad systems, say you could talk about UCLA, how does this idea, or you could challenge this idea, you could say that you see them as legitimate, right? Uh, but I have the perception that we, we kind of have a hierarchy, a tiered hierarchy of what is truth and what is you know, mysticism. Yeah, um, it, uh, I guess um, just going uh, your earlier question uh, about ex extractivism and, um, you know, we live uh, uh, in terms of extractivism, I guess, like thinking and storytelling, the different kinds of stories that we tell in terms of the knowledge that I guess y'all are expected to produce um, in South Campus is oftentimes for the benefit of uh, maybe the markets or a very certain idea of like progress um, that doesn't allow for, I guess, other um, rhythms. Um, and so what I really loved about reading uh, part of um, Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, which I'm still uh, working my way through. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
at one point she talks um, about masked fruiting, which was like a new concept to me, but the concept that like oak trees or other uh, organisms will sort of like sync up their cycles and maybe not drop acorns um, on a regular predictable cycle would, mm -hmm. you know, which would allow humans to like harvest it uh, on a regular basis. But sometimes the, due to environmental stressors and other factors, they'll withhold for a long time before sort of like dropping a huge amount so mm -hmm. to ensure that, you know, some acorns get left to plant the next generation and everything. And so um, I think that um, in terms of storytelling and um, different ways of thinking about our environments, that um, sometimes it's just that the market or a kind of academic industrial complex does not value certain forms of knowledge because uh, there's no clear way to sort of monetize that. Yes. And so then there end up being stories or ways of knowing that sort of get shunted aside as, you know, uh, these are like very entertaining myths yeah. or things like that, but then not really taken seriously. But then, uh, you know, in moments of crisis, like because of climate change, um, thinking about different ways of tending, or, you know, working with crops or plants, or, uh, you know, I I read a couple of years back about a study where people were looking at like really old Druid literature mm -hmm. or something in Ireland where people always talked about this place has magical healing properties. And eventually they found like this new form of bacteria that they're using to sort of treat MRSA and other like okay. strains of bacteria or yeah, strains that have become kind of antibiotic resistant. Mm -hmm. And so these forms of knowledge that get marginalized, but over time become more important. And so, I don't know, it's really hard to think of their relative importance in a society where it feels like, well, how are you going to make Not us much. money for, exactly. you know, with your new startup? But yeah. that's sort of where my mind goes. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I, I kind of want to repeat the question to make sure I'm understanding it, but are you, like, you're pointing out that there's this, perceived well and probably very explicit actually hierarchy in academia of like from the, the hard sciences are somehow the objective or more true than other things is what you're saying and what's your question about it or yeah any any takes on on how much you mm -hmm. think implicitly or not uh, so oh I totally yeah right I mean and I think it's good for all of us to recognize I think I've completely I've totally bought into it I'm not now right like I'm untrained I'm, I'm actively trying to untrain myself from having bought into that and I mean even maybe like five or six years ago one of my favorite quotes which is not one of my favorite quotes anymore was from a physics education researcher and he was like and he was trying to say that like a lot of teachers a lot of physics teachers are like oh I taught the students in the lecture and it seemed to work really well and like they seem to like it and I feel like it worked and so it worked well and he wanted to diminish that and so his quote was like well that's just an anecdote and the plural of anecdote isn't data Right. And so like what he was trying to say is like, let's take data on what actually works with teaching. Mm -hmm. But what I'm realizing is problematic with that quote, right, is that like anecdotes do come from lived experiences. And so what was really the problem is that he was listening to anecdotes from a bunch of old white guys, like about what they thought worked in physics. But anecdotes from other people can be really useful. I mean, it's so like uh, can be critical, right, and critical in our learning and undervalued. And so I constantly need to catch when I'm having that hierarchy in my mind and recognizing that I'm devaluing things. And a lot of times I'm devaluing them because I don't understand them. They're words that I might call like woofy, which is just not good, right? Like that. So noticing in myself when I'm saying that and realizing that's that's my own like internal judgments and um, getting really excited to be in conversations like these and and shift to those and to read to actively read things that counteract those. Um, messages, but those messages are still very strong. I don't know. Do you all feel those messages? Like, is this? Yes. Okay. Um, and I mean, maybe starting to notice when and how people around us are reinforcing those messages. Mm -hmm. Am yes. I answering your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, I have one last pressing question before I open the floor. Uh, I've been meaning to really ask this question to both of you. I wanted to probe what do you take might be? Um, you know, going back to language, and let's pick English, which is a, a gender language. Not all languages are gendered, right? So in this particular case, have two genders, right? And we refer to them. Um, how can that shape 
the knowledge that we generated for our learning experience beyond things that are for us, at least in this framework, obviously generalized. And to say, if I were to refer to an electronic circuit, am I thinking in gender forms? Uh, when we think of objects, you know, are there any languages that we know of that are not gender that are able to create a different linkage because precisely because they're not associated to the concept of gender, at least in the language. That is a really good question. I know, I'm looking over at Anthony. Um... I can think, you know, I speak Basque as a native speaker, it's a non-gender language. Mm -hmm. And I think about this all the time, but I, you know, just because I'm a speaker doesn't, you know, I can't just code switch really easily. Mm -hmm. But I see myself thinking of an object when I'm thinking in English mm -hmm. or a system and about when I'm speaking about to use a, a gender pronoun. And then I suppose myself saying, why am I about to use a gender pronoun, right? And so I feel like I have a suspicion that depending on which language, Spanish is super gendered and speak Spanish, mm -hmm. depending on the language I'm speaking, I'm relating to my objects in genderized ways. And when that is absent from the language, I, it no longer is a problem. Not that it is a problem, but it no longer is concerned of whether I'm gendering objects or not, or I'm gendering concepts, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I wonder how, you know, language mediates that both in the sort of formulation of storytelling and the uh, teaching, um, particularly teaching of sort of objective things that should not have gender, right? Mm -hmm. I think I found that really interesting, but I don't know much about linguistics, so I don't want to do like, you know, head into the direction of like bad linguistics where it's like your language determines your worldview mm -hmm. like completely but I do find it interesting to like um I know there was some large anthropological study where they looked at you know um how many colors do people in various societies have for the shades between like blue and green for instance or like uh for different tastes and smells um and just sort of thinking about you know when we have a sort of, um, so this isn't as much related to gender, but thinking about um, sort of the frameworks that we are given to work with for comprehending our world and how can that uh, shape what we view as like significant or important. There was another um, study that I was reading about recently that was looking at uh, Western versus um, indigenous um, youth. And when they were given like storybooks, uh, how much attention each paid to like sort of the main characters like Bob and Sally versus mm. their environmental context and how that varied across cultures. And so, although I'm not really like an expert in that, I think for me, learning about uh, the environmental humanities and other cultural forms of comprehending the world has really gotten me thinking about life. Well, yeah, it's not just about, you know, these action heroes and like, you know, the good guy who mm -hmm. like is changing the world, but like um, sort of the context that they're in and how that can like um, change the story sometimes in unexpected ways. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks. Um, and I'm the, I, I honestly, I'm thinking, I'm trying to think, Sergio, of like gender and in teaching and in physics and especially gendered language and objects. And I'm not, I don't know. I don't know if I'm not completely understanding, but the best the best example I can think of that I don't think is what you're getting at is just when I took I took physics in high school, um, and I it was AP physics, and I think I was like one of the few um, girls that was in the class, and like all the examples were like nuts, and so many of the examples were like dropping missiles out of airplanes, right? Like, <laughs> and I mean they really were, and I didn't and I, I didn't think about it, and I was just like oh, I get to do math, like I was a nerd who liked it. Um, but I wasn't into it and I just was really was good at it, but wasn't into it. And then I took astronomy. And so for me, like astronomy was where like physics was describing these things that were just beautiful and part of the universe and amazing colors and really cool thoughts. And so then I was like, oh, this kind of physics is cool. And so it's a different kind of genderedness maybe than what you're getting at and probably like takes into account maybe gender norms and what people may or may, may be more or less interested in, but it's like, that's what the physics textbooks were doing, right? All those examples were maybe related to our military industrial complex. And so clearly what was being decided to be taught to people um, was being decided by certain people. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. 
and the other thing about gender is I'm to see it with my kids. Like I have kids who are six and nine and already at the age of three or four, anytime that they saw that they were like had a stuffed animal and they were pretending it was something, it was almost always a he like, and that, you know, that like, so just seeing how dominant gender is even for young kids. Mm-hmm. Neither of which is directly answering your question, but um, and so I don't know if you want to elaborate. I, or, on that. I, okay. I would love to spend hours talking about it, but I think I do want to allow our students to ask any questions they want to. Um, you can pick up the thread if you want to from that point, or just any other questions you have, but please. Hi, my name is Sloan. I was like, I was wondering, so I understand that we are in a very centered society, like we've been taught it, right? Creating and researching that's things that are very profitable. And I, I would, in my head, I think the goal, the goal is to kind of divert from that, which a lot of people say these are the things that we want, right? So then there's also the idea that there are also people who are interested in the things that we make profit, right? So then how do we differentiate the in today's society, how to differentiate things of like what we're truly interested in or what society has conditioned us to be interested in? Like mm-hmm. How do we make that separation? That's a great yeah. question. <laughs> that will have you well <laughs> been able to. That's, that, that, that's I mean, I'm trying to think through my own experience, but obviously that's my own experience and like what 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 we do for kids. And I think. I mean, if, you know, it gets back to what do we think the purpose of education is, right? And for me, I'm centering more and more on, I think the purpose of education should be exactly what you just asked, right? Is like helping people understand what, what impact they might want to have on society or themselves or helping others understand their human experience or whatever it is. And like, I would love if that were the purpose of education, but there's no, there's no currently really almost no classes in that. I can think of one, we have a career explorations course in life science, and it sounds like it's career explorations, but it's really trying to understand yourself and like what drives you and then um, think about it from that sense, which gets at it a little bit. And I also do want to recognize kind of the privilege though, that comes with talking about things that way. Like there's a reason that UCLA is preparing folks for a workforce, right? And there's like social mobility that comes with getting training in order to get a job that pays well that lets folks support their families. Mm-hmm. So I also want to recognize the the balance there, even if it's an extractive thing. Those are my thoughts. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm still very much figuring that out. <laughs> I always feel like the bad like uh, child of immigrants because I didn't go into like a practical um, field. That would let my mom kind of sleep well at night be like oh it's gonna be taken care of and so like um yeah that's something that I've really been trying to balance and figure out and right now I'm very much interested in sort of like academia and making it on the tenure track um but then also thinking of like opportunities outside of that I think especially in places like LA where there's so much industry and everything and I think when I talk with students it's like you know I have a friend from high school who uh, was really smart, went to MIT, did eye banking with Goldman Sachs for like, you know, five years to a decade, but then burnt out, did Burning Man, you know, like lives in the <laughs> desert now with a partner and their dogs. And it's like, you know, trying to like figure out, you know, I kind of reached the peak that we're all supposed to hit, right? <laughs> um, according to capitalist narratives, but like, what do I really want out of life? And like, I don't know, I think like for me, it's been interesting to like see that of like, even if you do reach a point where you're like financially stable, I think. I feel like I read about recently a study that said like the biggest predictor of burnout versus job satisfaction is like feeling like uh, what you're doing, like feeling some sort of sense of investment in that and like your relationship to the world. And so, yeah, I think um, when I work with, you know, students in my classes who are sort of like STEM track and everything, it's really cool to see, you know, their investment when they're like, oh yeah, I really want to like do X or Y and change the world that way. But I think also like for other students who are kind of like, well, I know this is safe, um, but then also trying to think about their lives outside of their jobs and like, how then can I use like my stable career to like give back to my local communities mm-hmm. or like find ways to like turn things I'm passionate into uh, about into like, you know, I can have my uh, sort of um, segmented nine to five, but what do I want out of life outside of that? You know, and so I don't know how it's been. For you. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to respond, but 
If one <laughs> focus on both of you, it's sure. my way of dodging the question. So no, I also make the time for others to ask yeah. questions. So please, these are great answers. Um, okay, I have a question. Like maybe that I feel like I haven't thought about like climate change in like enough of different ways, but um, I think like a lot of the narratives around climate change is like okay, like scientists are like saying like we have all these facts to make it happen. And then there's like other people who are like, oh, I don't believe it. Like this is just my feelings or my thoughts or like, and because we're like trying to like not think about like is like facts and science in terms of a hierarchy, but also like we need to like help the planet. Like how do we navigate like being like actually like this is real? <laughs> Have you found the solution? <laughs> 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 Um, exactly that's a good question and I right not 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 my expertise but I mean good to recognize that right and I think a lot of it actually is storytelling is my understanding is a lot of helping people think this is real is not telling people facts as far as understanding climate change it's telling people stories about like what has happened in places where climate change has impacted people what will happen to their kids mm -hmm. um but somehow stories that don't make them want to crawl into a hole and like crawl up curl up into a ball. Um, so that's my my understanding is like focusing on stories instead of facts in a way which is um, connects to I guess the theme. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think in addition to what you're saying, like uh, one of the most interesting frameworks that I've learned recently. So in English, we have a field called affect studies, which is about sort of like emotions and how they circulate through populations, like when a politician is giving a really rousing speech. But one of the most interesting shifts that I've seen is sort of like thinking about climate change and these sorts of problems in a sort of the age of social media, where like if you look at the National Park Service or like Monterey Bay Aquarium, I think they've come to also recognize that like Oh, the same old narrative of like this poor polar bear on an ice floe that's mm. melting is super depressing and doesn't rouse a lot of people. And so what I found interesting is how people use like, um, I don't know if any of y'all are part of that wild green memes group on Facebook or Instagram, but like, you know, taking like animals that we don't usually think of as like charismatic of like, it's not furry, it's it doesn't look like have big eyes it's like a snake or some really gross slug or like a tardigrade and trying to think of like ways that you know by pushing them onto people's news feeds maybe with like a little story or like some relatable language um like kind of getting people to like care about or like pay attention to things that they might not otherwise because you know in a battle of like cuteness like a polar bear is always going to win out over like some ugly frog that's like really important to an ecosystem mm -hmm. but like these ways of thinking about like these irrational or like parts of ourselves that like care about things but like maybe in ways that don't always make sense and how do we like tap into that in order to get people to like care and get involved in a way that the usual thing of like sign this petition talk to your senator and then we'll like fix the problem doesn't always like um, inspire the same kind of energy in people. And so sometimes thinking about the way we interact emotionally or like these non-narratives and how they can be like inspiring. Yeah. And I just wanted to, before the question, I just think that the fact that you're asking the question is showing what's kind of wrong with like this hierarchy of sciences, right? And that like, that uh, science is thought oh if we just get facts together like everybody will listen and we'll solve the problems it's because they weren't working together they were thinking that like finding the facts is the most important rather than thinking about the integrated like let's figure out what's going on let's figure out how it's impacting people let's figure out how to like tell stories and be more and get this affect study stuff so yeah. you're just revealing what's what yeah thing on that. okay but it looked like you had a question oh uh, my name's daniel i'm pre-sociology and I'm thinking of social movement, this um, collective behavior, mm. and we're there's a question of all of this, um, and we're kind of looking at how like um, at least Olson is a book about public goods, and he kind of equates how social movement organizations can be looked at like companies in a way that they all organize and they all have to differentiate, and they work within an industry that's in a bigger sector. Um, and something that made me think about is how like do you if your organization is working to like save the panda bears, you can do things like, um, I forget the organization, but it's like, if you get a credit card, 
you can get a panda bear on it mm -hmm. when you make payments on that <laughs> it goes towards that mm -hmm. so then how does a organization the question i guess the sociologists are looking at is how do you take an organization that doesn't have that luxury of a cute animal market how do you differentiate from that and in a sense how do you compete in the industry to get money and you're trying to move like you have adherence constituents because your product is the organization and you want to achieve your goals so um just it got me thinking about like the markets and then i think um you touched on how like some things are just less marketable and that's like south campus focuses on what's marketable mm -hmm. um and it kind of made me think but climate change certainly on the rise um is it will it be possible maybe to predict when those niches will open up and are those times where things that are considered generally less marketable can kind of flow into the larger market and become fields and is that like i don't know like are those like 20 year spans or like shorter are they kind of just little spurts where people can get involved um there's a lot in that but it's the makes it just anyway i know some organizations have taken the complete opposite tack where it's like uh the like ugliest animal competitions where it like goes from like cuteness to like comedy and it's like oh i can care about this lunking uh animal that somehow has still survived um but also um yeah i don't know like um sometimes it's maybe about like proximity like I, the monterey bay aquarium they have like they've taken the like lo-fi chill hop like beats you can study to and you have that but with like squid in the background and most people are like oh that's kind of gross but like you know if they're sort of <clears throat> on your computer screen as you're studying for an exam or something it sort of becomes a part of your everyday life and you become like closer to it i've used it yeah yeah okay yeah or like so wild green memes group like every once a year they do some like uh charity thing where it's like oh you can pick your game like you know like uh i don't know like crustaceans or like um lizards and things like that and sort of like um i think there's daily voting or something like that basically a points leaderboard and i think that's like one way that within a very like bounded group of like science nerds you know like people sort of raise awareness about like the kind of work that they're doing with like um less charismatic animals that people might not study um like scorpions and things like that and getting them into a larger discourse in ways that like uh might be harder to do when you're thinking about uh I don't know, within the context of y'all as like students or like what we'll get, uh, maybe not NSF funding, but, um, you know, maybe local things in LA, like, I know people have been organizing to create those like wildlife overpasses for like uh, mountain lions and things like that. And often, like my first thought is they're sort of scary, I don't mind if they die off. But then it's like, how do you like create different forms of relationships where it's like, oh, okay, P30 or whoever like is a, Angelino, just like me, you know, and like kind of reframe relationships. And I think maybe with social media and like less serious ways of thinking about our relationships can open up some of that potentially. Interesting. Yeah. I I'm originally from um like the East Bay. So I go to the Monterey Bay Aquarium a lot when I'm home. And it's when they opened up like the deep sea exhibit, the giant isopod was kind of the draw. Mm -hmm. And before then, People look at that thing and they get grossed out because it's a big bug yeah. um but they like kind of found ways to incorporate it and then they got a touch tank and like that's really what drew people in and it was marketing and puns on social media so that's it's very interesting i'm sorry to think about that yeah cool okay i just wanted to point out something to promote with this like one that I, that I think is interesting is like this idea that organizations even organizations that are doing good are competing with one another, right? Like that, like this is also showing like our extraction mm -hmm. and our competition academy and like, oh, how do we compete with panda people? Because yeah. they think a lot cuter. So it's like good to notice how embedded that is and like even when we're thinking about doing kid things. Um and then um the other one about the mountain lions and I mean just connecting to education and science. Like one of the things I know that Summer X does here at UCLA and they do a lot of social justice education um, in this graduate school of education. So they have a whole thing on statistics and teaching it, um, getting it into schools, and a lot of it is about the mountain lions and like mountain lion population. And so that's just one way of like where we're taking science and taking a social impact and taking something that people might otherwise be scared of, right? And like integrating them in order to make education a little bit more 
relevant and maybe they tell stories about the mountain lions or develop in some areas. Okay, so was there a question? Um, yeah, my name is Johanna and I'm studying psychobiology. Um, so I guess I kind of got stuck right at the beginning on that idea of students as products. Like I had the idea, but never worded quite like that. It's like, you know, we're paying to be here for like in some way being paid to be here. And then the idea that like UCLA does want us to go out and be in these high level jobs and high paying and high in like societal rank. And I guess my question is like obviously you're not gonna have like the the solution to this, but like do you see a way of like this decentralizing like capitalist ideologies within teaching? Like does that exist or are they like in literature code like it is there a way? Right, like if you're a university in a capitalist system, mm -hmm. can you separate yourself from mm -hmm. the capitalist system that you're part of? Like, yeah, mm -hmm. humans first, students, like, it's a product first, students, and how does that look like this? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard. It's <laughs> really hard. <annoying. laughs> and part of what makes it really hard is that is not being aware of how much is embedded, right? Like, in me, I just feel like, still constantly every day recognizing that oh oh I guess that's another manifestation of like part of the capitalist system like and that's you know where I thought I was part of this I like I agree like idealistic we just talk about ideal we don't care about the money that's coming in um it's there but and I mean like and then the much less satisfying but like smaller answer like answer is that it's getting away from conscious right you're a psycho bio major like you're gonna be in classes that are gonna feel really competitive which um somebody brought up and like that just realizing, but fostering collaboration. And so like in a lot of the introductory STEM courses that I really like that, I don't know if people are thinking, they're trying to like have more what are called like liberatory frameworks of this, like we just want you to work together. Like we're all gonna learn better if you all work together. And so like, let's start that from the beginning. Um, and so try to make it that you're like, but it's not a problem of scarcity, which is I guess what capitalism is getting at. So how can we, make it not feel like a scarcity of knowledge and a scarcity of A's. <laughs> um, and more of a like, if we all work together, we can all kind of do what we can. That is the answer. Yeah, that get what you're at. No, it's awesome. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, please. No, no, go ahead, yeah. Please let me show you. I just thought one more thing, like awards, right? Like, I mean, we play a lot about teaching awards, but also there's student awards. And what I was thinking was like, there's very rarely like in, on campuses awards for like collaborating together, right? Like they're all individual awards. And like, and so I was just thinking, oh, wouldn't it be cool if there was like an award for a course where like an instructor works really closely with the graduate students and then undergraduates that take in the course and like together they design this really awesome course that like had everybody's voices, but like none of them would get an individual award. Like they so it's just right, just seeing how embedded it is and what we reward. And, and your answer really resonated for me too, like even as someone in the humanities, because I think oftentimes people think this is like more touchy feely stuff about like social justice and like love and things. But you know, like the humanities job market is incredibly competitive and it has a lot of the same pressures of you have to be that brilliant genius. And there's still this myth of like the brilliant genius who works in isolation when really like we all learn from one another, whether it's like faculty mentors or classmates. You know, maybe it was like two quarters ago where someone said something really brilliant and you're like, wow, that's really stuck with me since. And so I think, um, yeah, it's about like sort of accountability to like larger communities beyond yourself and like trying to, I don't know, like um, push to think ways to like collaborate as Dr. Chappé was saying, like where it's not just rewarding one person, like, you know, where it's like, if you're not first, you're last, but thinking of other ways of sort of um, maintaining those relationships and sort of like being reciprocal with one another and pulling each other up as we like know lives. And so, yeah, I don't know necessarily how you can do it as students who are like working in, within these like academic systems right now, but I do think these sorts of courses are maybe at a first step for each other. Yeah, that's what we're trying to do. I want to say something about it is it's something that I contend with all the time. And I, I do have a very cynical tendency. Yeah. 
I think it's a more honest way to start saying that we're creating marketable products, right? All at the same time, I think this is my philosophical belief, and this is why I decided later on, I didn't really necessarily follow a very traditional academic path, but decided later to come back and to do this. And it's because after all, and in spite of all of the issues, I think it can seem really daunting and somewhat frustrating to think, well, we trapped in this system that incentivizes profit over anything else. And of course, the university is not isolated from the system. But I also think, and this is when I sometimes, you know, in, in dark times, I always talk to some of my, my people, and one of them is, you know, late Bill Hooks, who argued uh, endlessly and really eloquently that, you know, education is the path to emancipation and liberation. And within the system, we don't need to break it to argue that. That's definitely in the United States, the intellectual capital resides in the academic complex system, in spite of the incentives that we may have in relation to society. All I'm saying is that within the system, if it's not here, the place to challenge any of these questions, where else? Right? So we participate in it, and as participants, we get to shape it. We a little more well, positive here. Yeah, I think. I just appreciate you bringing up Bell Hooks and that's just a, a wonderful thing to read if I haven't read her. But like one of the things that Bell has talked about is when she grew up in a segregated school. And so um, she she was like, my teachers in the segregated school, like their goal of education was was liberation. Right? Like education is liberation. And so I want to educate folks, like I want to bring folks into that liberation. And so she was so excited about that. And then integration happened. And so she started going to a school where she was taught by white teachers. And she's like, suddenly they were teaching me like yeah. <laughs> reading. And like, I didn't understand, like, why was I learning this? And they didn't seem to know why I was learning this. Like, this is just what you're supposed to learn. And then she's like, <clears throat> and then I went to Stanford and I was like, well, in Stanford, my professors, they're going to be there about like liberation, right? Like they're going to be self-actualized and like help me figure out what I want to do. And she's like, they were just like socially awkward and focused on like one thing. <laughs> and um, and so <laughs> <laughs> and so and I just hear what you're saying, you know, like I like like yeah, so like we can, right? And there's it's not that doesn't capture all professors by any means, right? But like trying to bring education back into this liberation framework of like how do I how is what I'm learning gonna somehow be liberatory for me or society or something like that within the system like that. Um, speaking on collaboration, I'm, I'm August, I'm a design major. Um, and then this quarter, I'm taking my very first physics class. Um, and I noticed that like the difference in like teaching is like like really different and like binary between like the way that you learn about the arts and the way that you learn like science. Like um, in like astronomy class, um, you like you like learn information, and then maybe you'll like have a study group with other people. But at the end of the day, it's about um, how well you perform on a test, like by yourself. Whereas in my like arts classes, um, like it revolves like it revolves around like a crit, and you have to like convince other people that your art is like important or like cool, and um, it's a lot more about like how you interact with other people. And I noticed that um, when you were talking about how you were um, making like learning the sciences like more accessible, you talked a bit about like partner sharing and things like that, and I noticed that that's Sort of leaning towards like sort of like a merging of those two types of um, pedagogies, and I was wondering if um, do you think they have anything to like learn from each other, and also why that separation exists in the first place. They definitely have something to learn from each other. That there's no question. Um, and what it would make me think of is like my favorite assignment that I did when I was teaching physics that I'm sure I got for a, a bunch of other people, people but I'm not going to give credit to but for my master's in teaching and culturally responsive pedagogy and so it was to have students like take the physics concepts we learned about and like apply them to some sort of hobby they had or a sport or just something from their own culture or whatever it was and they would work in groups and they would make an interactive presentation and they would take it back to whoever they wanted to share it with their family their friends members of the club or whatever it was and they would work together to teach them physics through this cool thing. And one of the coolest ones is this like whole um, ceremony of like a bunch of 
we both have to pull with ribbons wrapped around and it came somewhere from Mexico and I want to look at it more and they were like analyzing the angular momentum of like coming off of our school thing and they you know took that back to their family and taught it and so like that's what I want more physics to be like and that's what I think we can learn from and then they would right and different groups would look at different things and give feedback which is maybe a little bit so yes we can learn a lot from what art does and how art sees it and I think my guess is the difference come from this view that in the sciences there is an objective truth and I will teach you the objective truth and then you will tell me back that you know the objective truth mm -hmm. and I think in art there isn't that right and so there's more space for discussion and so I think as soon as we start realizing that whatever that the scientific facts are recognizing there's still so much subjectivity to where they come from why we focus on those and how they're used and that's what we can bring them to us. Um, I'm still trying to think through it, but I think um, part of it has been uh, like in the humanities, there people have talked about, oh, at a certain point with like postmodernism, is it just like anything goes? And I think what's shifted in the past couple of decades is like, no, just because, you know, these dominant Western modes of thinking about what reality is have been destabilized doesn't mean that there's no objective truth anymore. But I think um, one thing that you were getting at was very much about um, like our positionality in the world and sort of like the context that we grew up in in the form of truths and our perspectives and what we can know about the world. And so I think that in the humanities, it's like not just like speculation and fantasy and like uh, complete imagination, but also what happens when two forms of knowledge sort of start uh, overlapping with one another and leading into each other. And sometimes it can be really messy, but at other times it can like create these unexpected alliances where uh, maybe it's, um, for instance, a rural white community who is in close proximity to like uh, a reservation, like because both groups of people like have a certain type of relationship to the land that you can uh, do sort of like certain that they produce, sorry, like certain forms of like local interventions into like climate or environment that are very different from, you know, like what maybe a professor here at UCLA would like dictate as like, this is the, you know, quantifiably best optimal solution that we found for most environments, you know? And so, I don't know how much that answers you. <laughs> 